everyone, Josh here, and I'm at the beautiful, sexy new bar lounge in Hell's Kitchen called Industry. Today's show is going to be a really fun mixed bag. Not only are we going to chat with one of the owners of Industry, Bob Pontarelli, who is one of the men responsible for setting the bar for New York City nightlife, but we're also going to take a special look at one of my favorite organizations, Broadway Cares, Equity Fights AIDS, and their star-studded winter event, the Gypsy of the Year contest. But first up is the Bravo TV reality star and my favorite salon stylist, star of Tabitha Salon Takeover, the straight shooting Tabitha Coffee. So I'm lucky enough this morning to be sitting here with Tabitha and I get to ask her five questions. So here we go. Um, first question really is how did you end up coming from Australia to getting to this point here? Like what, what was your journey like? <laughs> Very long. <laughs> <laughs> um, I left Australia and actually went to London because I wanted to further my hairdressing career. So I had a stop in London, left Australia, went to London, worked for many years in London, retrained, worked for great companies, blah, 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 and then came to America because my mother was here. She was living here. She'd remarried and she was here. And then really didn't know what happened and started working because... I thought it was a great way to meet people. I miss not hairdressing and life kind of takes over and here I am 15 years later. And how did you transition into a TV celebrity? I'm really lucky. Well, you know I was on Sheer Genius on Bravo, the right. competitive hairdressing right. competition. I didn't win. <laughs> I did win fan favorite, but I didn't win the show. And when it was all over, I got a call from Bravo and they said, can you come and meet us for lunch? And I thought they were going to I don't know, rip up the contract and, you know, say it was lovely to meet you. Bye-bye. <laughs> and they asked me if I was interested in doing my own show. Wow. Well, you know I'm a devotee, as I said before uh, we started taping. I, I love the show, so congratulations. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I cannot wait for the next season to start. But one of the things, as we were talking about earlier, is like now I go into salons and I'm much more picky about it because of what you've shown us. What are the three things that we should really be looking at when we walk into a salon? Absolutely cleanliness. I, you know, to me that's number one because if the salon is filthy, it j to me it just means that everything is falling apart. People don't care. Otherwise, you couldn't work in that space. So definitely cleanliness. I think it's really important the way you're greeted. If you if you walk into a salon and there's a receptionist and you know they're smacking gum or eating behind the <laughs> desk and totally ignoring you, they're probably not caring about the clients very much. Um, and the stylist, I think the appearance of the stylist is really important. Are they screaming across the salon at each other? Is it all about them and their drama? Or do they look like they're focusing on the clients and doing great work? Now, you've traveled obviously all over the place in, in hundreds of different salons. Is there one moment where you were just like, this is an absolute hair disaster? You'll, you'll see a couple this season. Oh, yeah? Look, I get all nervous now. I'm like, <laughs> oh, the palms are sweating. It's bringing me back. It's like a flashback. You'll see a couple this season where it just, it felt like it was so out of control that I didn't really think people would be able to change enough to bring, to bring it back on track again. And so you can't really, we need to watch. You need to watch, but I mean, Provincetown was really, I went to P-Town, mm -hmm. which was amazing because it was P-Town. It was a real struggle, though. The salon was just a huge struggle for me and I spent a week in a children's salon. <laughs> <laughs> Tabitha in a children's salon. Like one where they stick you like in a uh, like you know like a yeah. fire engine uh -huh. or yeah. how, how was that? Um, that was long. That was a, re that was a, <laughs> a really that was a really long week. I mean everyone knows children and Tabitha not so much here. I mean it was a great business thing but it was it was really hard and the headdress is just were really miserable and didn't like children and you could tell that they weren't passionate oh. about anything. But to work with children, you have to like it or enjoy that aspect, obviously, of the business. Absolutely. And they were just totally miserable. Oh, wow. That's like a pediatrician hating kid. Exactly. It was <laughs> awful. Now, what is, would you say, is your favorite part of the job? Making people feel good about themselves. And, and, you know, that's one of the things I have to say, you know, that I absolutely love about the show. You come in and you, you know, just bust in there and, you know, you, you, you take no prisoners. And yet at the end, it's really beautiful and heartwarming. And, and you're an incredible sort of supporter of these people. And I, I think that, you know, that's a really important part of your show and who you are and what you do. 
And I think also, you're this really formidable force on television. And, you know, as we mentioned, everybody in our office is lining up to take photos with you. They, you're, you're so um, loved here. And, and as this, like, openly gay woman, do you see, like, any, res I mean, like, it's sort of a two-part question. This is my way of actually asking a sixth question. <laughs> um, do you, A, feel that responsibility? Mm -hmm. And two, like, what would you say to, like, these young gay kids as, as they're coming up and, and sort of thinking, like, hey, like, I, I, can I do this? Can I not do this? Where do I fit in? Um, I, I feel huge responsibility. I have to say, if I don't think I'm a celebrity. I don't particularly like that term. I mm -hmm. think that's reserved for actors and Isabella actresses Rossellini. and Isabella <laughs> Rossellini and people like that. But if my celebrity notoriety, whatever it is, can do one good thing, then it's hopefully able, especially young gay teens, to feel comfortable and proud of who they are. I just think it's, it's such a hard time for anyone to be young and trying to find out who you are when you're young and gay. It, can feel like your world is crashing down around you because it's so confusing and there's so many different messages going on. And I think it's great to have role models out there. So I get a lot of, you know, Facebooks and emails and people talk to me and they are a lot of young, um, you know, gays and lesbians that are struggling with coming out or just coming out or thank you for showing us that it's okay to be who you are. So the responsibility I feel is actually huge, especially at the moment in light of everything that's going on with, with teen suicide and bullying and things like that. It's been even more so for me. You know, honestly, I think the only message is, <clears throat> as trite as it sounds, it does get better. It truly does. It really does get better and I think it's it's about accepting yourself. When you accept yourself, you feel quite comfortable to tell everyone else to go to hell. All right, well that's beautiful. Thank you so much for sitting and talking with me. And, and I, like I said, I, I can't wait to check it out and, and good luck with everything and Thank congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So, as I mentioned earlier, I'm here at Industry in Hell's Kitchen, and I managed to grab one of the owners, Bob Pontarelli, for a little chat about his gorgeous new space, what it's like to be a restaurant owner here in New York City, and what's changed since he began his foray into nightlife back in the 90s. So, I'm here in Hell's Kitchen at the brand new, beautiful bar lounge industry with nightlife entrepreneur Bob Pontarelli, who is not the owner of one bar or lounge or restaurant in New York City, but three. So we're going to talk to him all about what it takes to be such a successful restaurant bar owner here in the city. Hi, Bob. Hello, Josh. How are you? Good. How are you? Good, thanks. Well, first of all, congratulations. My God, it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I have to say, you know, Bob took me in before the space was actually completed and they were building it out. and. You know, he definitely had a vision, and it looks really beautiful. Thanks. Hey, you saw it when it was concrete. 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 Nothing. Yeah, so yeah. Yeah. it was yeah. pretty raw. So how do you feel about it now that it's uh, all complete? Uh, you know, I'm happy. Yeah? I, I, yeah, it turned out, it, it, it's, uh, I can say that, you know, like, like all projects, um, probably 10 days before it opened, I realized it was all wrong and <laughs> started gutting it again and, and fixed it and got it. But in the end, it turned out pretty much uh, yeah, how I wanted it to be, yeah. Well, we should also tell our viewers that not only do are you one of the owners with your partner, Steven, here at Industry, but you also own the bar in Chelsea Barracuda as well as the restaurant Elmo. Why did you decide to come up north here to Hell's Kitchen to open your next place? Well, you know, we had, Steven and I had talked um, probably for for a while that um, if any thing had ever become available in Hell's Kitchen that w was a size that was different than um, the other things available that it was something worth looking into and and um, I had kind of taken it off the radar for a long time and then by accident literally one day I was walking by the space and saw a sign and, and pursued it and it, it happened very very quickly after that because uh, I think what drew us here was I mean obviously the neighborhood is is um, you know thriving and it's very exciting and um, it was unusual to find a space this big so the, the combination made it very really kind of appealing to us. What makes this one different and what was the sort of inspiration behind it? Well, you know, it's funny. I think that going back to, to even the, the beginning of when we started doing all this, we, we've always tried to um, do 
something that was alternative to what is also happening, or what's been happening for a while. And, and um, uh, you know, Barracuda at the time was, you know, when Chelsea was beginning, and, 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 and it obviously had a very, uh, Barracuda had a very East Village feel. feel. And um, we, it was very, uh, it was, it, again, it was an alternative. It wasn't better or, or worse, but it was an alternative to what was going on then at that time with Splash and, and a bunch of the other bars in the area. Um, Almo as well, and it's in its sort of aesthetic. You know, at the time, people were doing a lot of minimalist white walls, and we decided to do something that was bolder and bigger. And this, you know, I think in the last ten years, um, bars have become. Um, I think the the aesthetic has been a more polished aesthetic, mm -hmm. and um, in this case, we we did something that I think we I hope has, has more maybe texture and layers than than what's, what is also around. So, you know, it's not better or worse, but we, we try to approach the, every project thinking what's different, um, what, what isn't being done right now. Well, you know, I would be absolutely remiss if we didn't talk about one of your first ventures, which was Crowbar back in the 90s in the East Village. I mean, I, I was definitely one of my destinations. I wasn't living here at that time, but every time I came to New York, it was certainly on my hit parade. Like, A, how did you decide, you know what, I'm going to open this bar in the East Village, because the East Village is certainly a very different place now than it was when you guys opened Crow Bar, and what do you see as like the biggest differences between opening a bar in the early 90s and, and sort of having an establishment now? You know, when we opened Crow Bar, we opened on Avenue B and 10th Street, mm -hmm. and um, it really was the Wild West. I mean, it, it was a great time in New York City, and, um, you know, I again, we... We, it was our first venture, and we, we uh, looked around and um, thought, you know, very naively, um, very, very young and very naive, and we thought, oh, you know, owning a gay bar will be fun. <laughs> so we, wow. we went to Avenue B and 10th because it was cheap, and we opened a gay bar. And um, uh, it was just kind of, it, it, you know, the impetus for doing it was uh, kind of a naivete and um, uh, something to do. And... Uh, the I think with Crowbar, um, you know, it's very New York is very different, and our community is very different now in, in like vast ways, um, and uh, what people go out for is very different now. I mean, it's just it it couldn't be more um, more uh, unusual in the true sense of the word than when we opened. But I think that <clears throat> that when we opened Crowbar. Um, which, you know, I, I, it, it's very funny because what we've done since then, you know, we, we've had a, we had a restaurant in East Village called Leshko's mm -hmm. and uh, Barracuda and Elmo. And, and to this day, people will still say to me, if I went, you know, they'll say blah, 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 blah. And then when they find out we owned Crowbar, they're kind of like, oh, my God, you owned Crowbar? It, it, it was impactful in a lot of people's lives. Um, I, think it, I think it came, Crowbar came um, at a very interesting time uh, in our community's history. We made the party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you certainly did. You led the party, and I, I can speak firsthand for that. Um, I, I, I do have another one last question for you before we let you go. How do you keep doing it? That's my question. I'm like, <laughs> really I'm exhausted <laughs> watching you. I mean, yeah, is it just that you're this crazy overachiever? And, yeah, you know, I'm kind of crazy, yeah, crazy going? overachiever. Like, you know, you go, you, you, you do it for the moments. Uh -huh. You do it for, you, you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a lot of work and it's a seven day a week thing. And, um, and it's really, and it's, it's really fulfilling in an in a odd and um, uh, kind of, sort of crazy way. There are the moments where, you, you know, you'll look out and you'll see people having fun and you go, you know, that's a good thing. Well, the, one of the great things about writing and having your own little opportunity like this for me is that I get to gush on people that I have watched and known and adored for a long time and you know I literally feel like I grew up with you and your bars from Crowbar to Leshko's to Barracuda to Elmo and now to industry and I'm a middle-aged man and you have been nothing but kind and generous and you defy all the stereotypes <laughs> of a nightlife entrepreneur and, and your su continued support, like you said, not only just Wigsack, but so many different people and artists and events 
that I personally were involved in and, and not involved in were, are so great and, and you are just so loved and, and thank you for sitting down and talking with me for a thank split you. second. Really and kind. Thank, thank you. you, but more importantly, for all the other stuff that you do, Bob. It's really amazing. Thank you. That's really kind. And now for a real treat. The New York City theater community was one of the first groups to respond to the AIDS crisis in the mid-80s with benefits and fundraisers and raising awareness in general. Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS has been around for over two decades and the work they have done is unparalleled and the amount of money they've raised is astronomical. So it was a great honor for me to sit down with executive director Tom Viola to chat with him a little bit about Broadway Cares and take a peek inside their winter event, the Gypsy of the Year contest. Hi, today I am sitting with the executive director of one of my all-time favorite organizations, Broadway Cares Equity Fights AIDS. Here is Tom Viola. Welcome. Hey Josh, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good. I'm yeah. Very well. Well, tell us a little bit about the organization. As I said, like it's one of my favorites. I, I've been a fan for years. I moved here in 1995 and uh, went to my first Gypsy of the Year contest that year wow. and, and have been a fan ever since. So tell us a little bit about the history, how you got involved. And, and sure. I know it's 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 in its 28th year. Well, 22nd, actually. We started in 1988. Okay. So we're 22 years old. I, I try to remember that we're as old as Phantom. Okay. Phantom, oh, well, Phantom, that's... Phantom opened, and we got started at just about the same time. <laughs> Good to and know. And I'm happy to say that Phantom's been involved with us incredibly ever since. Fantastic. Yeah, which is great. Um, but yes, we started in 1988. We were two separate organizations. Um, Equity Fights AIDS came out of Actors Equity Association, which is the union for actors and mm -hmm. stage managers right upstairs. That's where my office was. Um, I was Colleen Dewhurst's assistant. She was president of the union. Oh, fantastic. And also um, a terrific actress and a wonderful woman. And um, I was also their special projects coordinator. So when the, equi when the union began this committee, the Equity Fights AIDS committee, it was assigned to me to basically administer. So um, Colleen was very determined that Equity Fights AIDS find a place, not only in the neighborhood here, but certainly at Actors' Equity. So she really just said, you know what, just run with this ball. Do as much as you can, involve people, just whatever you want to do, you have my blessing, do it. At the same time, another group called Broadway Cares, a group of producers, was founded across the street. Um, now, we sort of worked together, um, but in the very early days, there was probably a feeling of like, well, there was there really room for two organizations doing sort of what looked to be the same thing in this neighborhood. Roger McFarlane came on board about a year in. When he came on board, he met with me and he said, you know, basically this sort of feeling that one or the other of us have to go is not the way this is going to be. We're going to work together. And we did. We even, I mean, this is in the days of way before computers and everything. I remember sort of mocking up stationery that had our logo and his logo taped to the top of it that we would just Xerox, you know, upstairs. And we began to even write letters together and really wanted to cement this idea that the two organizations were really one. And uh, so that happened in May of um, 1992. We moved upstairs, there were about five employees. I think the first year that we were working as Broadway Care slash Equity Fights AIDS, um, I think we raised maybe, you know, two and a half, three million dollars. Well, here we are, whatever it is, 2010, whatever that math is, 18 years later. And, you know, last year we raised over 13 million dollars. Amazing. You know, I think what Colleen, um, you know, imagined it might, might have been, it's, it just superseded, I mean, all of our expectations and hopes, and it, it's been an amazing journey. Were you ever surprised by the support? I mean, obviously, Colleen Dewhurst was behind it, so you had oh, a pretty powerhouse, folks. but, you know, like the fact that people really did come on board, come on board early, yeah. and through their sort of, you know, Broadway sort of entertainment muscle behind it. I'm surprised constantly. I really am. I, I don't take any of this for granted. I mean, there are folks who have been involved with us from our earliest days, whether stars, you know, folks, stage managers, actors, you know, and there are, there are folks who join us, who have joined us all along the way. I mean, basically, I figure every year when we start to do this, let's see, it's, it's a matter of let's see if we can do this again. <laughs> and you just try to engage with folks in a way that it's a win-win situation. You have 
so many different events throughout the course of the year. I mean, obviously you mentioned couple Gypsy of the Year, the Easter Bonnet, Broadway Backwards, Broadway Bears, back exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah. and uh, do you personally like? Are they all your children, or do you have a favorite? Can you tell us? Oh God, I, you know what? Is I, that an unfair question? No, to it's, ask? it's not. I, I mean, my favorite. I, I, I mean, the one that has my attention always is the one that we're working on right, right. now. It's silly, but one of my favorite events of the year, every year, and it really has nothing to do with fundraising, <laughs> is Broadway Barks, which is the big adoptathon mm -hmm. that we do in Schubert Alley with Bernadette Peters. Mm -hmm. We're literally, I'll bet, I think we've done 12 of those, and I'll bet there have been five or 600 animals that have been adopted wow. there. Amazing. And I love dogs, and so it, it's a great day. It's an easy day. I just get to show up and tell myself the minute I walk into the alley, you cannot bring anybody home. <laughs> so, yeah. So, but it's it. You know, they're they they're all. Well, I know it's a slightly unfair question because, yeah. of course, I mean they're they're all amazing. No, and, and, and you know, I remember how Broadway Bears started with Jerry and some of the guys from Will Rogers Follies mm -hmm. dancing at the bar on the bar at Splash. So literally, when I'm sitting at Roseland and five thousand people have come in and out of there over two performances right. and two hundred dancers have been on stage. It's, it's it's discombobulating almost. I mean, you, you, you just mentioned uh, Broadway Bears and how it sort of started mm -hmm. with these dancers on a bar in, in, a, in Splash. <laughs> Aside from the obvious, you know, just size of the events, is there something that you think like, wow, the, it's changed so dramatically? Obviously, there's still this cr incredible heart to the organization, which is has been retained, which is, uh, I think, an attribute to you and, and to your staff and, and why people sort of collectively sort of rally around it. But like, as you look back on the 22 years, it's like, wow, you know, we started with, you know, like you said, taping, you know. And we still do. I mean, <laughs> I mean we're a very professional organization. You know, we operate by every rule that the IRS needs us to operate by, and you know, we interact with this billion dollar industry out that window. But there's also a feeling of sort of summer camp mm -hmm. about us. I mean, and hands on. I mean, the, the entire organization truly is not based on contract, it is based on personal relationship. There is literally mm. nothing that anybody here has to do for us, do with us, do for us because there's something written on a contract that I could point to and go, well, that's what it says. And do you ever get a chance to just sort of like, in the craziness of all of it, just to step back and just sort of look at it and say, hey, look what we do, look what we've done, and, and yeah. sort of, you know, just sit in the moment of like, yeah, this do. amazing accomplishment. I do have a sense of how much time has gone by, how much has been accomplished with an extraordinary amount of help. This, this job is, you know, it's, it's saved my life. Before we go, I just want to tell you, I moved to New York in 1995. Okay. I think I mentioned I saw my first Gypsy of the Year that December. Yeah, cool. And I wrote you, I typed you a love letter because it was one of the most impressive, moving things. And oh, I sort of have a film theater background and, and I was so incredible and I begged you for a job and you were kind enough to meet me, and and um, I just want to say thank you for taking the time back then You're to uh, meet me, and I really appreciate you sitting down with us today. Sure. You've done and, very well. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> but um, I, congratulations, and Very we'll welcome. definitely talk some more. Great, thanks, Josh. It's such a pleasure. Thanks a lot. So that about does it for today. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Just Josh. All right, sorry. One, one more. It's called a double Windsor, to be exact. Was that weird? What are you looking at? Hold it higher. I said higher. Bueller, Bueller. Now what? And I'll see you next time. And I'll see you next time. And I'll see you next time. Okay. That's what you call comedy. You're in front of the lens again. Hi. 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 Oh my god, you guys, hi. Oh my god, okay, this is what I hate today. This is my hate of the day, fine? Does anybody care? Not really. But I hate when you're in a taxi, you're trying to get out, people are honking behind you, and the taxi driver is like taking their damn sweet time to like count out the dollar bills like you're gonna increase their tip the longer they take. But meanwhile, they're really just on the phone and not paying attention at all, and you're like, eight dollars back. 
eight, and I'm like banging on the fucking like plexiglass window. I'm like eight dollars. Meanwhile, like everybody else is like already inside the club, and like there's a line down the block of other cars. It is the most annoying thing ever. For people who New York don't live in New York City, they don't really care. Now what?